I described to him the country of Europe, particularly England, which I came from, how we lived, how we worshipped God, how we behaved to one another, and how we traded in ships to all parts of the world. I gave him an account of the wreck which I had been on board of, and showed him, as near as I could, the place where she lay, but she was all beaten in pieces before, and gone. I showed him the ruins of our boat, which we lost when we escaped, and which I could not stir with my whole strength then, but was now fallen almost all to pieces. Upon seeing this boat, Friday stood, musing a great while, and said nothing. I asked him what it was he studied upon. At last, says he, "'Me see such boat like come to place at my nation.' I did not understand him a good while, but at last, when I had examined further into it, I understood by him that a boat, such as that had been, came on shore upon the country where he lived, that is, as he explained it, was driven thither by stress of weather. I presently imagined that some European ship must have been cast away upon their coast, and the boat might get loose and drive ashore, but was so dull that I never once thought of men making their escape from a wreck thither, much less whence they might come, so I only inquired after a description of the boat. Friday described the boat to me well enough, but brought me better to understand him when he added with some warmth, "'We save the white mans from drown.' Then I presently asked if there were any white mans, as he called them, in the boat. "'Yes,' he said. "'The boat full of white mans.' I asked him how many. He told upon his fingers seventeen. I asked him then what became of them. He told me, "'They live, they dwell at my nation.' This put new thoughts into my head for I presently imagined that these might be the men belonging to the ship that was cast away in the sight of my island, as I now call it, and who, after the ship was struck on the rock, and they saw her inevitably lost, had saved themselves and their boat, and were landed upon that wild shore among the savages. Upon this I inquired of him more critically what was become of them. He assured me they lived still there, that they had been there about four years, that the savages left them alone, and gave them victuals to live on. I asked him how it came to pass they did not kill and eat them. He said, No, they make brother with them. That is, as I understood him, a truce. And then he added, They no eat mans but when make the war fight. That is to say, they never eat any men but such as come to fight with them and are taken in battle. It was after this some considerable time, that being upon the top of the hill at the east side of the island, from whence, as I have said, I had in a clear day discovered the main or continent of America, Friday, the weather being very serene, looks very earnestly towards the mainland, and in a kind of surprise falls a jumping and dancing, and calls out to me, for I was at some distance from him. I asked him what was the matter. "'Oh, joy!' says he. Oh, glad! There see my country, there my nation! I observed an extraordinary sense of pleasure appeared in his face, and his eyes sparkled, and his countenance discovered a strange eagerness, as if he had a mind to be in his own country again. This observation of mine put a great many thoughts into me, which made me at first not so easy about my new man Friday as I was before, and I made no doubt but that, if Friday could get back to his own nation again, he would not only forget all his religion but all his obligation to me, and would be forward enough to give his countrymen an account of me, and come back, perhaps with a hundred or two of them, and make a feast upon me, at which he might be as merry as he used to be with those of his enemies when they were taken in war. But I wronged the poor honest creature very much for which I was very sorry afterwards. However, as my jealousy increased, and held some weeks, I was a little more circumspect, and not so familiar and kind to him as before, in which I was certainly wrong too, the honest, grateful creature having no thought about it but what consisted with the best principles, both as a religious Christian and as a grateful friend, as appeared afterwards to my full satisfaction." 
While my jealousy of him lasted, you may be sure I was every day pumping him to see if he would discover any of the new thoughts which I suspected were in him. But I found everything he said was so honest and so innocent that I could find nothing to nourish my suspicion, and in spite of all my uneasiness, he made me at last entirely his own again, nor did he in the least perceive that I was uneasy, and therefore I could not suspect him of deceit. One day, walking up the same hill, but the weather being hazy at sea, so that we could not see the continents, I called to him and said, "'Friday, do you not wish yourself in your own country, your own nation?' "'Yes,' he said. "'I be much, oh, glad to be at my own nation.' "'What would you do there?' said I. "'Would you turn wild again, eat men's flesh again, and be a savage as you were before?' He looked full of concern, and shaking his head said, No, no, Friday tell them to live good, tell them to pray God, tell them to eat cornbread, cattle flesh, milk, no eat man again. Why then, said I to him, they will kill you. He looked grave at that, and then said, No, no, they no kill me, they willing love learn. He meant by this they would be willing to learn. He added, they learned much of the bearded mans that came in the boat. Then I asked him if he would go back to them. He smiled at that, and told me that he could not swim so far. I told him I would make a canoe for him. He told me he would go if I would go with him. I go, says I. Why, they will eat me if I come there. No, no, says he. Me make they no eat you, me make they much love you. He meant he would tell them how I had killed his enemies and saved his life, and so he would make them love me. Then he told me, as well as he could, how kind they were to seventeen white men, or bearded men, as they called them, who came on shore there in distress. From this time, I confess, I had a mind to venture over, and see if I could possibly join with those bearded men, who I made no doubt were Spaniards and Portuguese, not doubting but, if I could, we might find some method to escape from thence, being upon the continent, and a good company together, better than I could from an island forty miles off the shore, alone and without help. So, after some days, I took Friday to work again by way of discourse, and told him I would give him a boat to go back to his own nation, and accordingly I carried him to my frigate, which lay on the other side of the island, and having cleared it of water, for I always kept it sunk in water, I brought it out, showed it him, and we both went into it. I found he was a most dexterous fellow at managing it, and would make it go almost as swift again as I could. So when he was in I said to him, "'Well now, Friday, shall we go to your nation?' He looked very dull at my saying so, which it seems was because he thought the boat was too small to go so far. I then told him I had a bigger, so the next day I went to the place where the first boat lay which I had made, and which I could not get into the water. He said that was big enough, but then, as I had taken no care of it, and it had lain two or three and twenty years there, the sun had so split and dried it that it was rotten. Friday told me such a boat would do very well, and would carry, "'Much enough fiddle, drink bread!' That was his way of talking." End of chapter 15